All right, thank you everybody. Thanks for hanging in there for Sages on Friday afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Sages and the committee for giving me this opportunity to present this panel today. So uh, I'm gonna try to talk about esophageal physiology, how to interpret studies, and why and how to set up uh, your own lab in about 10 minutes or so. Um, or as I'd call it, uh, the fast and the furious. Okay, so first, I don't have any financial disclosures. So two main objectives are to kind of give you a very quick crash course on interpretation of esophageal physiology studies, specifically pH testing and manometry, and then also uh, some information for you on why and how to set up a lab, including some of the finances behind it. So why should you interpret studies yourself? Why not just rely upon a gastroenterologist? Well, I think uh, this is multifold. I think one of the first things is, if you're gonna be a foregut surgeon, or if you're gonna operate on the esophagus, the stomach, the GE junction, you need to understand the physiology. You're not gonna go out there and rebuild a 68 Chevy uh, engine by yourself if you don't understand how pistons and cams and actuators and how all that works. I mean, you're just setting yourself up for disaster that way. So I think it's really important to understand the basic physiology so that you know how you could potentially alter it without having catastrophic events. Um, you have to be careful that if you are getting studies that are read by other people that they are not error corrected. Uh, software works pretty well, but as somebody who used to do signal analysis back as a previous engineer, signal analysis software is still not perfect. And there are definitely times when um, analysis software can come up with results that may not be completely accurate. So I think it's really important to be able to look at the studies, look at the waveforms and tracings yourself, look at the uh, entire duration of the pH study and look for potential sources of error. You maybe disagree with the interpretation of the gastroenterologist. Uh, again, most of the times I think between myself and my GI physiology colleagues, we will agree on interpretations of studies, but there are definitely times when I've said, hey, you know, I've picked up on a peristaltic wave when they were calling it achalasia, by definition it's not. And there are occasions when those types of things happen. So I think it's really important for you as a GI uh, surgeon to really understand that s side of things. And then, of course, if you do redo operations, understanding the physiology will help you in terms of un, uh, determining why somebody has recurrent symptoms or new symptoms or persistent symptoms. Somebody has dysphagia after doing a hiatal hernia repair. It could be due to a multitude of factors. And if you understand the physiology and you perform the testing, you can kind of look at that between knowing the anatomy, knowing the previous operation, and then seeing the results of the study. It can help tailor um, how you plan to do a, a revisional operation should you need to. Okay, so in terms of study interpretation, again, can't teach you everything in about 10 minutes. So if you really have an interest in this or you're really gonna do high volume, I mean, take the time, take a formal course. Uh, I was pretty lucky as a resident at Northwestern, John Pandolfino was just starting creation of the Chicago classification. He actually gave me my first couple lessons in uh, manometry interpretation at that time. But things do change, especially with uh, the, um, uh, um, sort of updates in high resolution manometry. So I think it's really important that you do try to take a formal course uh, to kind of understand the subtle nuances behind it. Definitely read all the papers about Chicago classification and interpretation of manometry that can help you understand subtle differences. But as a whole, um, there are probably just a few key features that I look at when I'm uh, looking at physiology studies that help me with my operative decision making. And I'll just kind of go through those really quickly with you. So for manometry, I think there are two key things that you should always look at. First is peristaltic function. Somebody comes in and they're complaining of uh, regurgitation, dysphagia. Yes, there's a high likelihood it's uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It could be some other sort of motility disorder. So you really need to look at the peristaltic function of the esophagus. And it's not just to look at the composite. If you get a report from somewhere, they'll usually have a composite picture of a peristalsis, peristaltic wave or of a, of a uh, hybridized swallow between all 10, and that doesn't really give you the true picture of what's going on with each swallow. So I think it's really important that you look at each and every single one of those swallows to uh, make sure that you do not have moderate dysmotility, severe dysmotility. Unfortunately, there are probably a good number of people out there who, as they're interpreting studies, they just sign their name on the bottom of whatever the software puts out. And if you're not really looking at each swallow and looking at the numbers, you could get fooled and you may end up doing an operation that's either contraindicated or um, whatnot for that reason. 
Um, some people will argue if you're doing um, esophageal physiology studies for reflux, do you actually need to do manometry if you're going to do a partial wrap every time? Well, my opinion is yes, and some people would counter-argue, well, what about a patient who has a large parasophageal hernia, you know that they've got esophagitis, they've got dysphagia related to it, why are you doing the manometry study? You're not going to get a good evaluation of lower esophageal sphincter. In my mind, it's still important to be able to get information about the peristaltic waves. And even if I can't get good, accurate information about the LES, at least I can see each of those 10 swallows and I can determine whether or not there is good motility of the esophagus or not. Um, uh, Dr. Ellie's going to give a talk on um, uh, tailoring your fund application. Uh, of course, that's a separate discussion. Some people do, some people don't. I personally uh, potentially will, depending on what the manometry findings are like, as well as correlated with the symptoms. But again, uh, this is uh, a surgeon decision here. Second most important thing I think you need to look at is the LES uh, function. Um, specifically, what is the LES doing at rest? Was it doing at relaxation? Looking at the IRP, the integrated relaxation pressure. All these things will help c give you information about um, how, t how tense the uh, LES is. If you have somebody who has a good story for gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, heartburn, uh, response to PPIs, and they happen to have a hypotensive LES, you've got a good story for somebody who needs an anti-reflux operation. At times, you may not have that clear of a story, and, and information about the uh, lower esophageal sphincter function can help you in terms of your operative decision making. I do put this at the bottom to recognize we're pretty much using IRP now as, as, the, um, as the quantitative information to talk about lower esophageal uh, sphincter dis dysfunction and dysmotility. Um, recognize, again, that uh, specifically in achalasia, that it's um, an IRP that exceeds your upper limit of normal in addition to the aperistalsis. I did not put a specific, specific number for, um, for, for the uh, upper limit of normal for IRP. It is somewhat software dependent. It's typically on the order of about 15 millimeters of mercury or so if you're looking for some guidance there. But um, it has been known to be a little bit software dependent. Once you get beyond these two things, then there are some more other subtle findings um, related to uh, contractility of the esophagus, um, propagation of the wave at the distal esophagus. Whether this really influences your operation or not is probably d still debatable. I think we're learning more and more about these subtle aspects of esophageal motility as we're doing more and more high resolution manometry. I think the area where it may help the practicing surgeon is that maybe it'll tell you who not to operate on. And somebody who's got moderate severe dysmotility, and at the same time, you're not really sure if they have true reflux-related uh, uh, symptoms, maybe manometry will make you kind of second um, or, or think a little bit further about it. Do additional workup to really make sure you are addressing uh, the patient's specific symptoms and that their expectations are managed appropriately. Uh, going to pH studies, why do pH testing? And again, if you have somebody who's got severe esophagitis, Barrett's a uh, very classic story, you could argue pH testing is a little bit more on the academic side and you're still going to treat them um, one way or the other. I think the times to utilize pH uh, testing is when you don't have hard signs. Maybe you've done an EGD on a patient, they have a very small hiatal hernia, their symptoms are a little bit vague, you're really trying to determine whether or not this person's symptoms are related to reflux or not, specifically acid or non-acid reflux, pH testing can help. Um, I think we, we as uh, foregut surgeons get a lot of patients who have a whole uh, cluster of different symptoms, some of which again are more classical, some of them are more non-classic, and pH testing can really help kind of uh, delineate uh, in those areas. Uh, patients who have no response to PPIs, you know, they started out with taking nothing, they're now on 40 twice a day, and they said they had zero changes, well, is it really reflux that's causing their symptoms? And pH testing can help you in that area. Um, sometimes I do get patients also who you're like, wow, the story doesn't sound right and they're really pushing for an operation. Sometimes the pH study can actually help you get out of doing an operation for somebody who's completely ingrained in their mind, I have reflux, I need an operation, I need an operation, and despite what you tell them, you don't have good uh, quantitative evidence of that. And sometimes the pH study can help you there. Do you have a little bit, little bit careful, study comes back falsely positive, and next thing you know, you may also be uh, cornered in the other direction. So important things. Oh. Um, 
In terms of pH probes, uh, we have pH standard pH monitoring that just measures acidity. We have uh, pH impedance monitoring that uh, should help us to try to identify more episodes of non-acid reflux as well, looking at um, decreases in resistance as fluid moves up the esophagus. Um, for patients who don't tolerate having a nasal catheter for 24 hours plus, we do have uh, Bravo wireless uh, pH testing as well. So in one slide, quick interpretation of the key components of your pH study. I think, first of all, you need to decide, are you going to do it on or off of PPIs? Ideally, you do it off of PPIs to give you the best um, accuracy as to whether or not they have unusual acid reflux or not. Some patients can't tolerate it and end up being on PPIs during the study. Um, if it's a good study and they're on PPIs and they still have an abnormal Demeester score, that may suggest, yes, this is really a problem. Yes, they really actually have refractory um, reflux symptoms despite being on uh, acid suppression medication. Um, with the advent of impedance testing, we're trying to identify more uh, non-acid reflux. Again, you could be on a PPI, it can neutralize the substrate that's coming up, but at the same time, you can still have neutral material irritating the bottom of the esophagus. So we start looking at total number of reflux episodes, and uh, depending on uh, studies that you read, they're varying, but typically in the 70 range. So what happens, you do your pH impedance testing, maybe their Demeester scores pretty much normal in the normal range, yet they have something like 130 episodes of uh, non-acid reflux. This may indicate that they have good acid suppression and control, but that they still have non-acid reflux that's causing them to have the typical symptoms. Um, I think in this area, you do have to look at the tracings very carefully yourself. The way the tracings are performed between the multiple electrodes can give you a false positive rate. And again, as a, somebody who's done signal analysis, I think it's just extremely important that you go back through and do error correction, regardless of how, so how good software has gotten. Finally, in terms of managing um, patients and their expectations, you have to look at symptom correlation. And if you have good symptom correlation with the episodes of reflux, maybe that also makes you more inclined to say, yes, this patient's really having symptoms that are related to these episodes. Um, so that's my quick uh, two-minute uh, spiel about manometry and pH testing. So why do you want to set up your own lab? Well, first, if you do foregut surgery, you need to have somewhere where you can do this testing. And there are many locations that do not have in-house labs, and it's maybe something that you want to start on your own. Um, you don't have one easily accessible. You need to refer somebody to a different city um, or further away. Um, in our state in New Mexico, we have many patients from all around the state who get referred to Albuquerque because there just aren't that many GI physiology labs around there. So at least we were able to offer it. Some other smaller towns are starting to offer these services as well for the patient convenience. Um, there's a possibility that you have a, a GI group there, but they have no interest in it. Uh, further down on the slide, I talk about additional source of revenue. Well. Physiology testing, unless you're doing really, really high volume, doesn't generate a whole amount of uh, revenue. And I've got some slides talking about CPT codes and reimbursement after this. But at the same time, what it may help for you as a surgeon is that if you have a lab and you're offering these types of services, the providers may consider referring these patients to you should they end up needing operations for that sort. So in a way, it helps you not only for your operative planning, but it can also help your referral base as well. Um, I also say that it's also useful for other physiology testing. Uh, pelvic floor motility disorders are becoming more common, so if you have colorectal colleagues, anorectal man manometry uses a very similar um, um, software package and very similar catheters uh, for that purpose. So you may be able to get a, a sort of a bundled uh, benefit from uh, developing your own physiology lab. Uh, this is pretty obvious. What do you need to set up your lab? Well, you need space to put the equipment, but fortunately it's not a large amount of space. Uh, you need to buy the equipment, and I'll talk about pricing here shortly. You need to learn to train to utilize the devices, train your staff to place the catheters, uh, train them to download the data. You need to learn how to interpret, and again, I caution people just not to rely on what the software puts out by itself. You really need to create an interpretation, not just reciting numbers back. And then you need to learn how to code uh, for doing the procedures. So in terms of pricing, to set up an esophageal high-resolution manometry lab, it's in an order of $75,000, which is actually a pretty large chunk of change. Um, so for institutions that can't necessarily put the initial down payment for this, I know there are a lot of uh, industry groups that are willing to do leasing programs and, and whatnot or, or spreading out payments over time to make it a little bit financially more feasible for somebody who wants to develop uh, a manometry setup. Uh, adding anorectal manometry is typically about a $20,000 additional add-on uh, to the esophageal component. In terms of 24-hour uh, pH testing, Bravo setup and the standard impedance testing there, they use the same software system 
systems typically. Um, a Bravo setup is about twenty to $25,000. Um, which includes typically two receivers, all your software, a computer, uh, buffer solutions, etc. Additional probes, the little detachable disposable probes are typically about $1,300 for a pack of five. Um, if you are going to do additional 24-hour impedance testing, the uh, separate um, recorders for those are approximately $6,000 each and they are reusable. So as we talk about reimbursement, these are your typical um, motility testing CPD codes. Um, for esophageal manometry, it's the 91010. Uh, you can see there, again, that the um, Medicare uh, reimbursement for it is not particularly high. The uh, professional fees is not particularly high. I mean, our view is it's only 1.28. So again, you don't usually typically use it as a money generator, but it's something that will uh, help your center and probably help uh, attract patients to you if you are doing these operations. I also put up there the anorectal uh, reimbursement as well, just so you have an idea in terms of if you are going to make that small investment and you have a colorectal colleague who's interested in pelvic floor, pelvic dysmotility, that uh, again, bundling it may uh, be a little bit more uh, financially accessible. Similar for pH testing, the uh, 91034, 91035 are your two primary codes for standard catheter as well as for Bravo. Um, you can see, what again, what the uh, hospital fees are, what the uh, reimbursements are, and again, you need to do relatively high volume if you're talking about just purely breaking even. But it, again, there's more to it than just um, uh, generation of revenue from that standpoint. So at our institution, GI owns all of our equipment. They own the physiology lab. We have one gastroenterologist who's uh, my physiology counterpart. Um, they typically do all the billing for all the reads and whatnot. But I think by having the partnership, it's allowed me to have access to all the raw files. I have it on my own. Uh, uh, computer system in my office that I can even interpret the studies before my colleague has gotten to them just because she is just one individual by herself. I think by looking at them on your own, what it allows me to do is that if there are patients who I don't think are operative candidates, we're able to have more of an intellectual discussion about dysmotility disorders and they're able to handle the management of that more successfully. Um, we did not have Bravo when I started at my institution and I introduced that in. And that was something that the GI, phys the, uh, GI doctors at my hospital actually refer the patients to me uh, to actually place the probes. So it's kind of interesting from that standpoint. They do get the facility fee because they own the equipment. I get the professional fee for reading them. But again, it's not really from a revenue generation standpoint. It's more from a relationship building, referral pattern standpoint. And hence, they're very proactive about sending patients to me for uh, operative uh, procedures. So in conclusion, I think it is important, very important to learn how to read your own esophageal physiology studies and at least understand some of those basics. Um, definitely, if you want to learn more, I think you should consider a course in it. It's not GI's territory. We as surgeons need to understand the physiology behind it. And it's, it's actually a very interesting subject once you start delving into it more and more. And then finally, if your institution does not have it, you've kind of hopefully uh, learned a little bit about the costs and finances behind setting up a lab. And um, it, it's something that's inevitably valuable if you do have a, a large floor gut practice. So I'd like to uh, thank you very much. We're behind. No, we're doing questions on, on so go ahead. Are there any questions from the floor? I'll ask you a question. So um, if you're interested in getting into this, what's the learning curve? How many normal studies you have to read, how many abnormal, and, and are there any resources online where you can basically go through a bunch of cases and, and see if you, sure, sure. you're reading things correctly? So in terms of learning curve, I'm not sure what the learning curve is. I mean, we read all the physiology studies in Seattle, so it was like 20 to 30 per week. So by the time we were done, you know, we had read hundreds and hundreds of studies by the end of the year. I'd say probably I don't know if you'd say about 50 to 100 is maybe a learning curve area. I think learning the subtleties is the, is the tricky part. Normal studies become very easy to read. It, it's the subtle changes or patients who've had previous operations where it becomes a little bit more tricky. And in terms of learning resources, yes, there are lots of webinars. There are a lot of free classes. Um, again, if you contact any of the companies that provide the equipment themselves, they're more than happy to uh, provide online training modules. Sometimes they can even uh, provide access to other uh, um, GI-sponsored physiology uh, reading courses that last a day or two. So those, those are definitely out there.